first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to give you my impression and maybe yours of what our, our images of Africa are really like. Let's start there. Now, this is the, the uh, Tarzan and Jane image of Africa. In fact, these things are real. This is what the Ethiopians tried to hold off the Italian machine guns with when they were taken over. And this is an actual spear, hand wrought iron, which many people don't realize was something that was uh, practiced in Africa. The blade is beautifully done and there's a carved handle. So there is dignity in these objects, even though they are associated with the unfortunate word primitive. Because Africa and its art, which we're actually going to talk about today, is anything but primitive. And some of the religions in Africa date to before Christianity. And you're going to, in fact, let's go back to the figure on the table. It is called Olumeye. And it is the word for the Yoruba greeter. The one who greets you into a home. And instead of my cards in the little pot that's in front of her would be white cola nuts. And white cola nuts, gee, you look so somber, Tracy. <laughs> would, white cola nuts would cheer you up <laughs> because they come from Coke. And in fact, that's what Coca-Cola comes from, cola nuts. And it is a stimulant. And it's given to you like one would offer a drink when you come to a nice household. And a figure like that, an Olomeye, is carved by a Yoruba master carver. And it comes from a tradition that is conservative. So, just like a Christian cross, Olomeyes have to look alike. If they aren't looking like a cross in Christianity, the Olomeye doesn't serve its purpose. So, you have conservatism. Not wildness in African art. Get the point? So we're dealing with a classical art tradition that goes back before the time of Christ. And we can actually see that. And you're going to see some of the figures here that exemplify it. So that's my talk. This is the stereotype. And let's move on to something that's a little more enlightening. How long has there been wrought ironwork? Uh, that goes clear back to the 3rd century A.D. from Meroe. Good question. And it spread southward. Uh, have you heard of the uh, pharaohs of Egypt who were black? The black pharaohs? There were. There were. And the culture from Meroe, which was also iron smelting, swept down into southern parts of Africa. And what you have here, and by the way, the announcement for this presentation, which was so nicely done, included two masks. How many of you saw the announcement with the elephants in the center? Raise your hands. A few of you did. And I know you were perhaps hoping for elephants, but I couldn't fit them in my van. So I brought you nevertheless so you wouldn't be disappointed. An elephant. An elephant. And maybe you recognize part of it anyway, right here. <laughs> the nose comes from the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> this is an elephant mask. And a very valuable one. And it does two things. If you look at this, of course, that's the trunk. Okay? But behind the trunk, look at that heart-shaped face. Some of you have been exposed as Harleen to the Museum of Primitive Art, one of our camera persons here, knows where this kind of thing comes from. She's been in the Museum of Primitive Art in New York, the Rockefeller Wing, and the Nelson Rockefeller Collection has one of the famous Quelle elephant masks that's nearly a duplicate of this one, and I'm thrilled to have it. But the heart-shaped face behind it, this lovely Valentine's Day face, is, presents opposites of aesthetic presentation. The trunk with that hard angle is almost cubist. Instead of a graceful looping elephant trunk, it's more angular. But the heart-shaped face behind it is everything lovely in an idealized way. And those two poles, cubism and angularity and gracefulness of form, like the curvature of the arabesque, are the polarities that you see often side by side in African art. 
and they give it a certain drama. It's like the yin and the yang. It's like comedy and tragedy, the two masks. But many African pieces combine them both. And they do it in a masterful way. So masterful that the moderns were overwhelmed by that. I mean by that the avant-garde artists of the early 20th century, Picasso, Modigliani, Braque, the rest of them. This was circulated, the pieces that they got from African traders and also in the flea market, the Marche aux Pousse. They actually collected African pieces, shared with, with each other at the Paris cafes, and the beginning of modernism was launched in the beginning of the 20th century. How many of you were familiar with the fact or have heard that Picasso was influenced by African art? Raise your hands. Okay, so this is an audience that at least knows that much. Did you also know Modigliani, Brancusi, Giacometti? We're going to be taking a look at the pieces that actually influenced them. Here's the problem with understanding African art by way of cultural diversity and giving dignity to people who are often dismissed as primitive. We have never given full credibility to the genius that actually is behind African art. And the reason why it ignited the adrenaline and went straight to the heads of these moderns, the early modern masters. So that's what you have here is some of what did that and you're gonna learn more about why. Let's start by giving you something quite dramatic and develop it from there. I mentioned the yin and the yang. The fact that all human beings have a positive and a negative side. Eastern philosophies often bring them together. So also do African. They bring them together in some ways more successfully than I found in other cultures. When I got back from Africa, I found that I was influenced to think differently, philosophically. It affected me very deeply at a spiritual level that was more encompassing. What I want to show you now is what I call the shadow side of African art, which one can create with lighting, but also is present in many African masks and figures. This side that is almost threatening. Now, there is also the light side, and we'll get to that. But first, let's take a look at the shadow side of African art. So Robert, when you're ready, we're gonna turn these house lights off, and we're gonna go to that shadow side. Brancusi and Baole art.
That is me doing my Hollywood best to grab you. <laughs> All right? <laughs> I confess that. I confess that. It's all the Hollywood tricks you can use, <laughs> including Frankenstein lighting, where you take something this beautiful, you put a candle under the nose, and it looks like horrific. So anyway, but the point is that some of those masks were indeed intended to be social control threatening masks and act like cops. What you also saw there were some of the masks which we are now going to talk about in terms of what every culture presents, human beings create in order to answer the questions, who am I? Why am I here? Some of you may be wondering that. And where am I going? And within that context, certain myths are developed, cultural myths. And you have to explain how you came here. Who are these human beings? You begin with the primordial couple or the father and the mother, Adam and Eve. And now I'm going to take you to the other side of the room here where we're going to see Adam and Eve and the primordial couple and we're going to start life there. So I'm going to start here. This is dad. Take a look at his face. This is the father. This is a chief, a royalty, really a king from the Hemba people of the eastern part of the Congo. Now, if I say this is your father and you look at that face, how many of you would say that face is threatening, possibly evil? Or would you say no? He looks like he's kind of got it together. I see a person saying, yeah, he looks like he's kind of got it together. Is he smiling or frowning? Just in between. He's in between, Mona Lisa. But he's not upset, right? He's not upset at all. You'd like to have a father like this, and that's precisely the meaning of this ancestor figure, which is that idealization of the chief or the king of your people. Now, there's an interesting thing going on here. You see the face, which is very tranquil and possessed right there. But look at the belly. What's that? Pregnancy. Pregnancy. So in a male figure, we nevertheless have the mother. This is where we all actually come from. So the female is honored in the chief's figure. The combination, the yin and the yang, the male, the female, in one sculpture. Kind of like the cubism and the angularity there. Africans were masters at it. Now, since we've talked about the mother, let's go to her, but in a different tribe. We have a figure clear on this side. She is called Guan. Guan is one of a group of your ancestors. This is the ancestral mother. There is also a warrior that protects you, and there is a king who is male. But here we have the female among the Bamana people of Mali. The Metropolitan Museum of Art has a number of these famous figures from the Guan society. She's got a baby on her belly, protruding breasts, but look at the dignity like that of the father in the face. This is a woman who's got it together. There is that grace in her. So she is the idealized mother. And that's what you have. That's father and mother. Now let's bring them together as the primordial couple. And we're going to go to a different tribe, the Senefo. And the Senefo represent the father and the mother. Here. Now one thing you might notice, the women are going to like this. Who's taller? Mama. Mom. Deliberately. Deliberately. Because there is full honoring of the importance of motherhood among even patriarchal African societies. And some of the African societies are in fact matrilineal. They trace birth not through the father, but through the mother, okay? 
We know who the mother is. We don't necessarily know who the father is. That's the point. So this is practical. So here you have the mother. Now, some of you who are familiar with African art and also the influence on modernism, does anyone recognize a possible artist who might have been influenced by these? Giacometti. Aha, uh -huh. he says, now I get it. This is where Giacometti got his, inf his inspiration. So now you see that the influence of African art in the early moderns was far more than just Picasso. It was literally almost all of them sharing this art. Giacometti, how much does a Giacometti go for now if you were to buy one at auction? About a trillion. Uh, she says a trillion. It's not quite a trillion yet, but you're getting close. <laughs> The point is, the modern artists now are the far more celebrated, and their things bring millions. Speaking of Modigliani, the second most expensive painting in the world was sold this last month, a Modigliani, for 170 some million dollars. Okay? You can get these. I got them for sale, a lot less but not insignificantly. These are, in fact, important pieces. They do. African art has gone up in the art market, just like everything else. And iconic figures that actually show the influence like that are what is desired by the major collectors. So, the primordial couple. Question? Um, their facial expression seems to be different than the others. Well, somewhat, although it is more contained. Sad or more, are they more sad or more? No. No, again, it's just a contained expression. It's hard sometimes to read an expression in a work of art. It's a little risky. Right. Uh, like, for instance, filed teeth. That's just beauty. Right. That's just beauty. It's not, they're going to bite you. Right. So I showed a mask up there that had filed teeth mm -hmm. as a threatening object with the music and the light and everything. But in fact, it's a beautiful woman mm. with filed teeth. But it's a good question. It's a good question. Okay, so there's your primordial couple. That's where we came from. After you're born, how about what you need to survive? Food. Milk. Food. You got it. <laughs> Mom got you the milk. Now it's up to dad, in most cases, to bring home the bacon. And that's exactly what dad does. He goes into the fields and plows. Agriculture is the key to survival. And the development of agriculture is a major role in every civilization, okay? And I use the word civilizations. Don't ever think that Africans are not civilized. The blessing of agriculture, mythically, came from an animal that combines an aardvark and a roan antelope, the two. The aardvark pokes his nose into the ground Can you see this? That's an aardvark underneath this, which is a roan animal, antelope. What are the two things being represented? Planting, poking your nose, and sprouting grain, like the horns of the antelope coming up, okay? What gives it the ability to do that, the seeds? The sweep of the sun in the sky. This is just the tip of the iceberg in the symbolism of African art. That's just the bare minimum. But these are, how many have seen any of these kinds of figures before? Raise your hands. And have seen, yeah, this is the most popular form of African art that nearly everyone thinks of when they think of African art. It's called chiwara, and that's two words, chi, wild, wara, animal. Wild animal, in this case, wild farming animal because this figure and that one, which is the male, the female pair, this is the male, that's the female, that was the mythical animal that gave the knowledge of seed planting to the Bamana people. So they honor the knowledge of agriculture coming to them from an animal associated with the ground, with the planting and agriculture. That's Chihuahua. Okay, now you've got your first steps towards surviving with food. But now you have to learn something more about your people. And there's the process of initiation. So the next step in the life cycle is Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, or public school. Now, I was a, I was a, a Cub Scout. Okay, but I didn't go all the way up to Eagle. 
<laughs> I didn't aspire to do that. But you can. And so also, now let's talk about how do you get your training in a typical African village or society. And when we say village, we're giving it too small a thing. When we talk about the Yoruba people, we're talking about 22 million Yoruba people. 22 million Yoruba people with one of the oldest religions in the history of mankind. Humankind, pardon me. Let's put the both in. Here's how you get your training. You've heard of Outward Bound. As a young man, and even now, we have kids go off to certain camps where they have to do physical exercises or they have to survive on their own, just as you would learn if you were in the service and you were getting rigorous training to survive out there in the desert or in the jungle or wherever, all right? And it's going to be an endurance run. The same thing happens with where I served in Liberia, West Africa. They have the Poro Society for Men, Boy Scouts. They have the Sandi Society for Women, Girl Scouts. You learn different things. Those things that are appropriate for your sexual orientation. Okay? The sexual orientation is epitomized in this mask. Here's another mask. This is an idealized, idealized female face, neither old nor young. She has white over her eyes. That is like the white of the kola nuts. It is a symbol of wisdom, knowledge, and at peace. It is also representative of the fact that when the girls who go through the training to become young women, it's unfortunate it's got such a bad name, but I can understand why, but the boys are circumcised and so are the girls. When they pass that, the white goes over the eyes and they come out like debutantes. They are now fully women, okay? The mask represents idealized female beauty, neither old nor young, ideal. She is called a mother mask, okay? Once you get past your training, that mother mask might come to you, if you're a boy, while you're in training and you're under a period of stress, because you are segregated and taken away from all female parties, they're not permitted in the sacred bush where you get your training. But there are oftentimes when you need encouragement from the compassionate mothering nature of women. And when that happens, first of all, the mother mask may go into the village. She's called Deyangle. And she asks for food to take into the bush school as a contribution to the boys who were there. Now, mind you, the actual mothers of those boys are very concerned about their boys and their survival. So that mask brings back the compassionate nature of the woman to look after them. Even though it's worn by a man, it gives that spirit of motherhood, brings the food, nurtures still. You haven't lost your mother. You're going through a stressed time. Don't lose heart. And if you get through the whole thing, some of the skills you might learn would be music, carving, farming, hunting, all those things you need to survive. When you graduate, you get a miniature mask, which is your mother mask in this case, that you get to keep with you. And just like a passport, it says, I graduated. And this is the village I came from, this mother mask. Okay? Well, it makes a lot of sense. Every culture has something. We're getting back to wanting to give all kinds of prizes for kids that survive. They just did a new drawing and they get, they get an award. I mean, we've kind of overdone it. But the idea is recognize the kids when they make these steps up through life. And that continues. So here you have the passport mask functioning as just that, your passport. Now, this is from Liberia, where I was in the Peace Corps, up, up country. And I was present when the women came out, the young girls, and they all had the white. And they were all very proud of the fact that they'd gotten through the ceremonies to become fully women. There are other things that happen in training in different ways in other societies. Here's another mask. Now, this one's quite different, as you can see. 
This is more what we would call anthropomorphic. It looks like a woman. That you really can't say. We don't know whether it's masculine or feminine. It's very abstract. And the reason, this is a mask for the Bwami society. And it's neither male nor female. It's just an idealized heart-shaped face. There it is again. There it is again. That simplification of the human face. The Bwami is not worn. It's too small for that. It's held in the hand. And you, as a teacher, impart to both men and women who are going through their training aphorisms that tell you how to handle life better with more wisdom. And you can continue in the Bwami society all the way up a ladder to the senior Bwami. And you get different steps along the way, different masks that you can use. But that's what this is. It's a storytelling mask. And like the no plays of Japan, it's the storyteller who gives it life, who gives it a certain character to go along with the story and the aphorism here. In this case, he's telling. Make sense? Except for the beard. Except for the what? Beard. The beard. Now, the reason why you have a beard on a mask like this is simply to re represent age, wisdom that comes. And, and that's <laughs> why it's male there. And female. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You have ballet masks that are female, they got a beard. <laughs> so it's like this thing over here. The two are combined in one form. So that the male and the female are present, even though it can be titularly said to be female or male. Same thing going on here. And that's a good point. It's a good point. Um, training. Let's say it's completed. And you're now a teenager. A teenager. Whoops. What are teenagers known for? Rebelliousness. What? Rebelliousness. Rebelliousness. Yes. Got all that training up the kazoo. <laughs> wow. Time to cut up. If you go to a zoo, what's the most cut up animal you're going to see? The one that's always entertaining. Monkeys. Monkeys. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's a monkey mask. Simeon mask. Kind of threatening. I, if you remember, if you did, had it in this shadow side Hollywood thing I did with eyes, you know, kind of lit from back and very spooky looking. And that's, that's true. This is called a black monkey mask. And it's from the Bamana people of Mali, the same people who created that wonderful graceful mother over there. But here you have the monkey mask. And this is your teenager. <laughs> <laughs> is it Cuts up. By it's worn in particular ceremonies where misbehaving is ordained. <laughs> Smart move because, like David Letterman, a monkey mask is like the court jester. I'm going to make that comparison right away. We always have societies that have the cut up because we need the cut up to remind us of what we're not supposed to do. <laughs> And you have to authorize it. Otherwise, it's just politically incorrect and you can't be on major television. <laughs> so that's the function of a monkey mask. See how this makes sense? It's just the jokester, the court jester. It's Steve Letterman or David Letterman or Jay Leno or... Uh, or the class clown. The class clown. Were you the class clown? <laughs> and of course, everybody kind of loved you. And you got a big kick out of it. In and you called it. Who wears it? Uh, a dancer who has the authority in his society to be given the right to wear the monkey mask. Okay, not necessarily a teenager, but someone who has the authority to dance the monkey mask and during the dance to point out some failings of the chief. So. <laughs> yeah. That's what his function is. He can get away with it. So that's the function of the monkey mask, in this case called a kore mask among the Bamana people. Question? Um, in the film you first showed us, and a couple of these masks, the eyes are just barely slits. Yeah, good, good point, and thank you for bringing it up. That's the next one. You know how boys and girls, boys snails and puppy dog tails, girls what? Sugar and spice. What? Sugar and spice. Sugar and spice, everything nice. Why are we, so, Joy, talk about misogyny reversed. <laughs> 
we always take it. Oh man, there's, I mean, we are licked in this society. But your point is this. Take a look at this. Look at the eyes. Slits. Just slits. Now, does this look masculine or feminine? Feminine. feminine. Absolutely feminine. Pretty or ugly? Pretty. Pretty. Beautiful. Beautiful. So beautiful that Punu masks, and that's what this is, represent the ghost of or the spirit of a beautiful young lady. They're the antithesis of the monkey mask. This is your idealization of beauty. Again, in this case, however, youth is being emphasized and in a most wonderful and beautiful way. And look, it was covered with white. There's that communication of being welcome. And why are the eyes like this? Number one, to represent a transcendent feeling. You're literally part of the other world. This is danced only as a ghost of a maiden woman, a maiden lady, okay? So she has the white, but it also represents the ghost of that person. Now, why these eyes that way? You notice the eyes were slit here and here. We got female masks. Why do you think that might be? What's this with the eyes that might be being represented if we're talking about behavior among women and what's expected of them? Sublimation. Sublimation. Modesty. Modesty. Thanks. That's a Modesty. better word. Modesty. Modesty is a very valued thing. Not a, we don't have it much in politics today, but in African societies, a woman was supposed to be modest. She often was demure. And using that demureness, nevertheless, she could be a coquette. She could be a seductress with that modesty. Because in person, when you got her home, you don't necessarily have modesty anymore. <laughs> so you, Ted's looking at me with a knowing glance. <laughs> anyway, the point is, that's demure behavior. And it is a sign of beauty and proper training. So that's why I relate it to the Kore and now the young maiden spirit. You have the two going together, but showing opposite poles, one male, one female. Okay, from that point, You've gone through your training. You've achieved a certain measure of wisdom. You've gotten past teenage rebellion. And you're an adult. And now, when you're finally an adult, the world isn't necessarily going to give you all that latitude to be a cut-up, right? right? Right. I'll say, don't laugh your woman. Encourage him. Yeah. <laughs> so I was going to have Ted give me this, but I'm going to show you and here we now have, and you can see why, the cop. <laughs> yeah. This is a law enforcement mask. Uh -huh. And it was in the shadow side. This mask is like the mirrored glasses on a patrolman who's staring down at you and says, just give me your driver's license and let's see your registration because you're in trouble. Would that terrify people? Yes, absolutely. But it too has slit eyes. Yes, it does. There's some mystery in that, and there is some threat in that, isn't there? But it doesn't, not all Kifwebi masks necessarily had the slit, but it was common. But this mask is not really human, not really anthropomorphic, or zoomorphic. It's just the essence of something powerful. And that's exactly what they're doing here, to create a mask that represents a law enforcement officer. So here's your cops. And now, looks like it has a huge mouthpiece. Yeah, this is actually a mouth that's created from some think, we don't know why, and there's a whole lot we don't know, that there is an avian or an aviary expression, something being represented in a beak of a bird, maybe a powerful bird. We don't know. Maybe you can pick. Yeah, could be. But we don't know all of the symbolism because the, the Songi people who created this, called the Kifwebi, which simply means mask, are very secretive. So we have no real, thorough, pin-it-down knowledge about these masks. We just can see that they're extremely powerful and moving. There's your cop. Okay, gone through your training. You got social control, the cop. 
Maybe there comes a point when you're thinking, wow, I'm just confused. I need some guidance. Where's the psychiatrist? Psychiatrist. <laughs> Be surprised. This is Eshu. Eshu among the Yoruba. He looks very is, solicitous. Yeah, is the god of, yes, is the god of fate. And you need to go to a diviner or a shrink to ask what's going on. I, something's out of, out of sync. I don't feel at harmony with my fellow, my wife, my relatives, the village. I got problems. What do I need to do? You go to a diviner. These people still exist. This is a royal divination figure. It's actually about four and a half inches tall. That's all. Of Eshu, the Yoruba god of fate. Now, why is he also called the trickster? Because... You often ask for something and you think that's what you need and you get it and you wish you'd never asked. <laughs> Precisely. The trickster god, that's the reason we call is also in Western culture and mythology, Roman and Greek, this is Hermes. This is Hermes, Mercury, Caprice, Caprice. Every culture has to have chance and caprice. It's not all going to be explained away for you. And you have to be ready for the fact that you could be tricked. Okay? But this little figure is a royal babalawo. That's the giver of the knowledge of Olympus to the people below. Babalawo is the minister. And that religion still exists today. And there are university professors and there are priests of the Yoruba practicing that religion here in the United States now. As a matter of fact, one of my professors of African history at UCLA was a Babalawo. It's a very sincere, legitimate, older than Christianity religion. Let's not call it witchcraft. That would be a derogatory Western interpretation that doesn't fit. And this is a royal made out of ivory figure representing Eshu, because the more important substances like gold and ivory, just as in the royalty of Europe, were used for royal personages, okay? Now, let's say you've gotten all the way through, you've had your divination, you're doing okay, but folks, you're getting old. What's it time to do? If you're going to die gracefully, you better make peace as much as you can. Not only with your fellow human beings and your family, but with your ancestors. The ones who brought you here in the first place. And that introduces the one video that I'm going to show before the break. And Roger's getting ready. But what I want to talk about now is the central figure that is on the table over here. One that influenced Picasso. It is a Coda Reliquary Guardian. And I spoke up the word loudly when the video was showing before and I said, Picasso. It was because Dancer of Avignon was the Picasso picture you were seeing and right before it was this. This is a Coda Reliquary Guardian figure. Remember the male and the female? This is the male. This is the female. <laughs> Everyone is included. Male and female elements. That can't be proven. If I were asked, and every scholar knows this, we can't say that for sure. It just seems logical. But we don't have historical records to, to be able to say that's for sure. But here's your female face, very influential on modernism, and especially Picasso, dancer of Avignon, Demoiselle d'Avignon. The two figures in the four females that are in Demoiselle d'Avignon, the pivotal image of uh, pivotal painting introducing cubism, had African masks that were like this face right here. Okay? There's your influence. This is your departure to the ancestors. How is this, I call it a coda reliquary guardian figure. What do I mean? This is your tombstone. It doesn't stand in the ground over your bones. It goes over a basket and is attached to the top of the basket here. 
These project down into the basket, and in the basket are the bones of your ancestors. And consequently, there is organic erosion that often occurs from that material. And this organic erosion that occurs is part of the authentication of a genuinely old, antique Coda Relicary Guardian. Now, these go for a lot of money. At auction recently, one went for $1,082,000. One was hoped to bring $1.4 million at the last auction, but they overestimated it, and I'll tell you, it wasn't very good. It came from a famous collection, but it wasn't that great, so it failed to sell. Okay, I want to show you next something on the light side. This is kind of on the dark side a little bit. Got a little spooky there. <laughs> African art not only influenced artists, but it also inf influenced pillow making. <laughs> You've seen these. This kind of geometric patterning is very, very favored in fabrics. We've seen also furniture. This is a chief stool from the Ashanti. And you've seen stools like this, oftentimes used or made to look like this in Parisian apartments. They love this kind of form. So furniture, design, and fashion. This is based on African mud cloth. Bring it on up. Tell us where you got this. What's your name? Uh, my name is Peter, and uh, I brought this for to have Ron give his opinion about this. I bought this maybe about five years ago at an import store that used to be on Haley. And all I was told is that it was from Africa, and it is a mud cloth. Yep, and it's the real thing. See, the, there are little seams you can see going right down here. Each one of these was a strip, and then they're sewn together. They're handmade on a loom, and they're literally dyed with, with vegetable dyes and certain clays and muds, and you end up with, here's a print, and here's the actual mud cloth. Okay? And that introduced, thanks so much. That's the real thing. And these are vi right now, by the way, there's the tribal art and folk art uh, marketplace at the Natural History Museum. This weekend. That right now. It's going on now. And uh, Akim, who is a Yoruba, a Shogbo, there are many different people in the Muya. Akim is there with his lovely friend, Nina, who was born in Jamaica, but she is of Yoruba ancestry. And you can get mud cloth like that at the marketplace. So I'm going to put in a little plug, 85 bucks. That's not a lot of money for handmade cloth done in hand looms, vegetable dyes. That's cheap. Is he the one hit, hitting the drums? Yeah, he is. He is playing the drums. Yeah. He's a master musician, and I was hoping I might be able to have him, but he can't come. Uh, so I had you listening to some piano music, which is very lyrical and wonderful. But now, before the break, let's take a look at, again now I'm going to be a little Hollywood on you, going to bring out the ramp music for the models, and this is called Africa and the World of Fashion.
fashion and what you saw there now I'm going to let you say go on a break and we'll come back afterwards but what you saw there are the many ways in which we are overlapping with African culture including tattooing facial marking and so forth so that when you see the marks on an African face like this which are produced by scarification you understand then that the purpose is to beatify but there is more symbolism in these marks but we don't need to get into that right now. We need to take about a 15 minute break, have some refreshment, come back and we're gonna talk about the marketplace, which is crazy. <laughs> but it makes a fascinating subject and I can tell you more about it as a deal, but it's nuts, okay? See you after the break. <laughs>